Good evening, everybody, and thank you for, for joining us for our, our second um, webinar from the East Sussex I Group. It's nice to have you uh, with us once again. The webinar is being recorded and will be available again to watch later on our YouTube channel, the East Sussex I Group. So if you've not looked at it, have a look. The previous webinar is on there to view again. So there is one CET point available for today's lecture, and that is if you're watching it live from the link when you registered. CET point is available for optometrists, contact lens opticians, and dispensing opticians. This lecture will run for approximately 45 minutes with about 15 minutes of questions at the end. So if there, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, so during the webinar, if you have any questions throughout the lecture, then please type them into the box and we will aim to get through as many of the questions as we can at the end of the lecture. So I'd like to welcome today's uh, speaker, Mr. Kashi Qureshi. He's an ophthalmic consultant surgeon at East Sussex Healthcare Trust, specialising in the management of complex medical retina disorders. He performs intravitreal anti-VEGF injections, steroid implants, anterior and posterior segment laser treatments, as well as, as, well as high volume cataract surgeries. For the past 10 months, he has been the clinical lead for the East Sussex NHS Trust, and he is also a member of the Professional Standards Committee of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. So thank you very much indeed, Mr. Kreshi, for, for joining us today, and I'll, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Ian. So can I, yes, I can share screen, there we go. And connect it there. Right, okay, so I am going to talk about uh, minor eye conditions, and I put minor in inverted commas because they're often not minor, um, and can be seem to be quite major in fact. Um, and uh, these are things that um, you guys are now seeing in the community uh, and are managing a lot of, um, and um, some things are coming to us still, um, but it's definitely an area where it requires um, some, some sort of cooperation between um, our two sort of professions to be able to manage uh, things for the best for the patient so they get the best out of it, the best care and the best access to care uh, as they can, particularly now in the in the height of the or the light of the recent pandemic. Um, so this talk really is going has been sort of formulated trying to think about the um, conditions that you generally see um, in MEX and, and was formulated really from a list that uh, optometrists compiled uh, for WOPEC uh, lectures so I've sort of tried to address all of those all of those areas and if there are things that I've missed ultimately as a part of the lecture or at the end of the lecture that you you, you don't know about or you would like to know more about then then let me know. Um, most of these topics in fact nearly all of the topics are anterior segment type problems um, because I know my colleague Mr Kishani gave an excellent talk about posterior segment things um, a month and a half or so ago. So I'm not going to sort of go over too much of the same ground. So the first thing, starting from the front, um, corneal problems. Um, so, and as I said, this is, you know, minor eye conditions is a bit of a misnomer because in fact, corneal ulcers is in fact quite a major and sight threatening eye condition um, that if not treated uh, or recognized, quickly can result in rapid and permanent irreversible loss of vision for patients. Um, you guys are all very familiar uh, with, with corneal ulcers in particular in the community and are very good at referring them in. Um, and as you know, the ulcers can be a variety of different origins, but primarily the most commonly bacterial, then viral, fungal, and some inflammatory causes of, of ulcers. And I'll try and talk about most of these things and how to manage them uh, today. So the biggest risk factor of, of, uh, for having a corneal ulcer is contact lens uh, use, particularly soft contact lenses are, um, are the biggest culprit. Um, extended wear overnight lenses are also a particular uh, culprit of getting um, contact lens related infections. But also there are other factors that make people more likely to have um, corneal ulcers, um, ocular surface disease, uh, eyelid diseases, patients being immunosuppressed, and also 
patients who are uh, who have um, sort of neglect so they don't they're not looking after themselves they sort of accidentally poke themselves in the eye because of maybe mental um, uh, sort of abnormalities or dementia or learning difficulties and they accidentally poke themselves in the eye and they can get an ulcer um, the symptoms are um, extreme pain usually um, very very photophobic a lot of tearing the eyes very very red and angry and sore the um, pictures that I put here hopefully you can see them quite nicely are um, show very beautifully uh, what, what you can see with a often a ring shaped um, ulcerated lesion which stains often with um, fluorescein because the epithelium is broken down and there's uh, purulent material there there's also a small hypopian in the lower picture um, and these are the sorts of things that need to be seen and referred on the same day and we need to see them in the hospital on the same day it's often worth um, from your perspective advising the patients when they come to the hospital to bring their contact lens case with them if, if it is um, the, cat, the fact that they use a contact lens case because often sending the cases off um, for culturing yields um, a result whereas the corneal scrape sometimes doesn't yield the, anything um, but when they come to the hospital we assess them we measure the size of the ulcer both um, with um, a fluorescein dye to see what the area of epithelial defect is We'll make a note of any hypopian and we'll often measure that too. Um, and we'll perform a corneal scrape. Uh, corneal scrape is done with uh, topical anaesthetic drops and then with the edge of a, of a bent needle to gently um, scrape the base of the ulcer and then to plate the, the what we've scraped onto either agar plates or into some culture media and sent off to microbiology for urgent processing. Um, then what we do is start these patients on some empirical treatment. So this could either be a monotherapy with a quinolone or dual therapy with a quinolone um, and cephalosporin. So quinolone such as ciprofloxacin or, or ofloxacin or levofloxacin um, and uh, cephalosporin like kefiroxine. And in, in both cases, we would always give cycloplegia for these patients because the pain is really quite intense for these patients and the cycloplegia can really help reduce the pain um, of a corneal ulcer. So one question that's often uh, asked um, by optometry colleagues is how to tell whether these are sterile ulcers or, or infectious ulcers when you see them in the community because sometimes you can see little spots on the cornea but it's not really clear whether they're infective or not. Um, it's always probably the safest thing to do is to assume they are infective unless otherwise proven. However, um, there are ways of telling whether um, an ulcer, ulcer is effectively sterile or, or, or infectious. So sterile lesions uh, tend to be um, small, less than a millimeter, they're peripheral. There's often very little or no epithelial damage um, there's no mucus discharge, there's very little pain or photophobia, little or no anterior chamber activity, and often no lid involvement at all. Uh, whereas infectious ulcers tend to be larger uh, than one millimeter, um, centrally located, um, there's often a significant epithelial defect, there's um, significant mucopurulent discharge, there's a lot of pain, a lot of photophobia, and quite significant anterior chamber um, reaction that often the lids are quite puffy and swollen as well. So conditions causing sterile ulcers, well this picture beautifully shows a marginal keratitis um, and as you can see it's a peripherally located ulcer that's near the limbus um, and actually if you stain that you probably find that there's very minimal epithelial defect. Um, Marginal keratitis is often associated with patients who've got a, either a history or signs of blepharoconjunctivitis, and often they've not had any contact lens wear or no history of any contact lens wear. And it happens because the patients have a hypersensitivity reaction to staphylococcus, and the ulcers when they do form, uh, as they show in that picture, are parallel to the limbus rather than um, in the central area of the cornea. There's often a one or two millimeter gap of clear cornea between the ulcer and the limbus. 
Another cause uh, of a sterile ulcer is contact lens related peripheral ulcers. And these happen due to staphylococcal colonization of the contact lenses. And they cause very small discrete ulcers, which are 0 0.1 to 2 millimeters. But again, often there are no symptoms and there's very, very little anterior chamber reactivity. So they, they just, these little dots, they appear on the cornea in patients who've got contact lens wear, that the eye is often quite white and uninflamed and they're not really aware of it. So how to manage these things? Well, um, marginal keratitis can be treated with topical antibiotics. I would also add to this probably managing the underlying blepharo blepharitis and blepharoconjunctivitis is a good idea, will help it settle down and prevent it from recurring. Um, some people give um, steroid drops when the acute phase settles um, to minimize inf inflammation. Some people actually give, and historically used to give uh, combinations of steroids and antibiotics, and they tend to resolve very, very quickly on that. The contact lens related peripheral ulcers, um, really the best treatment is uh, stopping wearing contact lenses um, for at least a period of time to determine um, you know, that the cornea is settling. But if there is an epithelial defect, you can consider giving uh, a quinolone topical antibiotic until the epithelial defect heals. So adenoconjunctivitis, keratoconjunctivitis, it's extremely common and you know, topical to talk about viral illnesses at the moment. Um, COVID apparently causes a, some sort of conjunctivitis, but it's a very mild conjunctivitis and it's quite rare apparently. I've not seen it, but there are case reports about it. But um, typically patients present with this sort of pink eye appearance and if they've got corneal involvement, they get these little um, subepithelial um, infiltrates uh, that can appear, but often usually stay and, uh, and are not, there's nothing you can do to get rid of them. So epidemic keratoconjunctivitis is highly contagious. And that's the really important thing, because if you see one of these in the community, in Mex or, or anywhere else, please don't refer it to the hospital because they will infect everyone in the waiting room and infect everyone in your waiting room. So see it, diagnose it, advise the patient and discharge them. Don't see them again because you're, um, uh, or don't try and arrange a follow up for them because they, they should be, uh, they should be in lockdown um, really and not um, passing on their infection to anyone else. These keratoconjunctivitis can also infect the gastrointestinal tract, can cause upper respiratory tract infections can cause redness, itching, irritation of the eye, it can cause photophobia, epiphora, generally foreign body sensation more than pain. So it's not so much painful, but very, very irritable. Your vision can be blurry and the lids can be quite puffy and swollen as well as there being chemosis. Um, other uh, findings, they tend to have follicles. So when you evert the lids, you see these follicular reactions of lymphoid tissue. Uh, you can often get a clear or yellowish discharge and they get the keratitis like in the previous photograph and um, a lymphadenopathy. So often they get preauricular lymph nodes. So the areas just in front of the ears, if you palpate along there, you can, you can feel the lymph nodes are quite swollen sometimes. Sometimes these patients also have a fever and a headache. And of course, that's very topical nowadays with regards to uh, COVID because you probably won't want to be seeing these patients. And I would, I would arguably say, actually, in the light of telemedicine, that this is a condition that you could, you could diagnose on the telephone and you could diagnose with a, with a sort of video consultation as well. And, but it's one of those conditions where I would urge you try, to try not to see the patient if you can, because you're really risking yourself uh, getting infected with a quite a nasty condition if you do. Um, very commonly, patients will have the fellow eye affected I mean, in the past, um, pre-COVID, and many years ago when I was a registrar at Moorfields and in Manchester, they had a special room for um, adenoviral conjunctivitis patients where you'd take a patient who was suspected of having it, see them in there in a sort of hazmat type setup, and then you'd sort of you know, chemically nuke the room when you, when you left it, which is kind of what we do now. Um, but um, that's um, what... what these patients need because they're very, very, very contagious. And, and they don't really need any treatment in terms of drops or anything like that. They just need advice to not 
uh, go out, not try, try and stay away from other members of their household. No sharing towels or pillows or anything like that. Not handling any food that anyone else is going to eat. If they are very, very, very bothered by the irritation, lubricating drops can help the discomfort. Um, very rarely, if they get a pseudomembrane, we sometimes peel it off and give them steroid drops, but be really resistant to give them any, any treatment at all. So corneal foreign bodies um, and foreign body removals, this is a topic that some optometrists have wanted to ask about. So when not to do it, well, <clears throat> I think don't do it if you've got a patient who's got a high femur, so they've probably had some quite significant trauma if that's happened. If there's some sort of diffuse corneal opacity, so the question of it being an infection, definitely if there's a laceration of the cornea or sclera, you must not. So, um, you know, if there's any, if you do CDL sign and it's positive, it's a good idea really avoid doing, a, trying to remove the foreign body that's sent to us. To, to repair surgically. If there's a dilated or an abnormally shaped pupil, be again, be very careful because that's quite significant trauma will have caused that. Or if they've caused, if there's a shallow anterior chamber, particularly compared to the other side, because a shallow anterior chamber means there's likely to have been a, a rupture somewhere. How do we do it? Um, it's very straightforward, really, um, and something that I think is well within your skill set uh, as, um, as colleagues that I've worked with on optometry who are highly skilled. Simply topical anaesthetic drops, um, get a 25 gauge needle, you bend the needle so that the bevel of the needle is facing you, and you gently just tease off the, the, the foreign body. Once you've done it, you just make sure there's no perforation. Uh, you can do that before and after with 2% fluorescein or a fluorette and make sure that Seville sign is negative. And you just gently dig uh, underneath with the edge of the needle um, and then flick off the, the foreign body. And there's this, um, there is this YouTube video that I will try and put on. I'll just make sure that it's sharing. No, it's not sharing the screen. Let me just share this screen for you. Put it back to the beginning again. There we go. I'm sorry for the cheesy music. I'm not responsible for it. So you can see he's got the bevel facing you with the edge of the needle. He just sort of gently sort of digs at it a little bit. Dig, dig, dig. And then it sort of loosens. And there you go, it's off. And that's it really. That's taking a foreign body out. So hopefully that was, um, that was useful. If we go back to the condition, the um, presentation. Oops. Resume slideshow. There we are. Okay. So that's that's how you take off a foreign body. Um, and in the good old days, um, the casualty doctors would do it. Nowadays, they're too chicken. They don't do it anymore. They worry, I think, about perforating the cornea. It's incredibly difficult to do that until you, unless you poke it directly with the with the tip of the needle. But if you go, if you do this at a slit lamp with the bevel of the needle and sort of dig at the side of it, it's very, very difficult actually to cause any, any um, significant um, damage. Someone's asked about rust rings. Um, yes, if, if you can dig, dig away until the rust um, actually, uh, all the rust ring as much as you can is, is gone. Um, but you know, there'll be, a, there'll be a certain amount that you won't be able to get rid of and, and I wouldn't worry about it. As the cornea epithelializes, it just, it just gets rid of and it's not really um, anything to worry about. Um, some people do use a, a, an algae brush to get rid of foreign bodies or get rid of rust rings. I, I, don't, I don't really like them. I think there's a bit of an infection control risk with algae brushes. It's a bit, bit of overkill, but, but you know, if you use them and you're used to using them, by all means, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, why is this not advancing to the next slide? So Calasians, uh, next topic. Um, so what are they? And, and Calasians are particularly badly diagnosed by everyone, including ophthalmologists. They use or seem to, particularly juniors, seem to fail to understand what they are. And what they are is a, a lipogranuloma of the, of the meibomian gland. So it's an obstruction of the meibomian gland that gets a bit inflamed. And it can happen because of, of retained secretions of the meibomian glands. Um, often, if you use regular massage and hot compresses, um, it will help to drain the meibomian secretions. But if you do get a patient who got who has frequent recurrent calasians in the same location, 
and the, particularly if the lid margin looks a bit slightly ruffled and it's very unilateral you should consider um, other diagnoses like sebaceous cell carcinoma which is a very nasty condition how to manage chalazians i'm sure in the community you're all used to this but if they're small and asymptomatic um, they don't really need any active treatment hot compresses um, and a massage of the, over the lump can help to to, to clear it, the hot compress, you can buy things like the eye bag now, which retains the heat much better and you put it over the eye for about five minutes and, and that uh, melts the secretions inside the, inside the lump and when you massage it, sometimes they can then discharge more easily. Antibiotic drops, and they're not a primary treatment, but they do help to reduce the bacterial load. So they can be helpful in some patients, particularly if they've got um, sort of uh, anterior blepharitis with lots of um, uh, staphylococcal infections. Surgical incision, um, so that, that if it's been there um, for a while, then we can do an incision and curatage. Um, and, but now I think the CCG don't fund them if they're, if they're present for less than six months or three months, I can't remember, but they won't fund them if they're not, if they're present for I think it might be six months. Yeah, they have to be present for six months before you can actually refer them for us to, to incise and curatage them. And in some places, they do injections of steroid into the lump and, and that will help it uh, settle down as well. Oh, there's a chalazian for you. A hordeolum, which people often confuse. Um, an internal hordeolum is meibomian gland inflammation, so like a chalazian, and you get purulent material released from the inner conjunctival surface of the eyelid. And it happens um, due to staph overgrowth, so often they get a little bit infected as well. And an external audiolum is a, a gland of um, one of size or mole, which becomes um, a bit inflamed, and you get purulent material released from the, the outer lash line. And, and so that's a nice example of an external audiolum. Blepharitis, um, incredibly common inflammatory condition affecting the eyelids, causing discomfort, irritation. It can be anterior, which is bacterial, usually staphylococcus, or it can be a seborrheic um, disorder of uh, sebaceous glands, or you can get posterior um, blepharitis, which is meibomian gland disease, where you get breakdown of the meibomian lipids, uh, which make the secretions um, rather abnormal, and then the tear film very unstable. It's typically very, it's bilateral and chronic. And I think if you, if it is very unilateral, you need to be suspicious about sebaceous cell carcinoma. It can be an associated factor with many other conditions and it's uh, a cause of dry eye disease and 50% of patients with staphylococcal um, blepharitis and 25 to 40% of seborrheic blepharitis and posterior lid margin disease um, and posterior blepharitis is the leading cause of, of dry eye. Sometimes it can be related to demodex infestation, demodex being this mite, but that's um, less common. Um, and can be related to seborrheic skin conditions such as ocular rosacea. Also, um, long-term contact lens wear is, is also a factor to consider in, in, in these patients. So signs of blepharitis, so anterior blepharitis, you tend to get lid margin swelling and redness the crusting of the, eye, uh, of the anterior eyelid margin. So you get scales at the base of the eyelashes. Patients get recurrent styes and chalazians, conjunctival hyperemia. Um, demodex, if you get demodex, you get these uh, little collarettes of, of crusts further up the lashes than, than right at the base of the lashes. And you often get secondary signs such as punctate epithelial erosions, marginal keratitis like we talked about before, corneal pannus and some neovascularization of the cornea sometimes. If you get posterior blepharitis, you get um, thick secretions of the meibomian gland orifices. So when you, when you sort of slightly pull the eyelid down or evert the eyelid and you look at the orifices of the meibomian glands, you see these what are called inspissated glands with thick sort of oily secretions coming out of the, of the um, orifice of the gland. And if you put a gentle pressure of your finger over the eyelid, often you can express some of this oil out of the gland. Often you, you can find a sort of foamy residue in the tear film meniscus. Sometimes there are chalazia present with posterior blepharitis as well. 
And sometimes you can see little plugs of the orifices with lipid. Uh, and as I say, posterior blepharitis is very, very common, uh, commonly associated with dry eyes uh, because it causes um, tear film instability. And you get the sec same secondary corneal signs as you get with anterior blepharitis, punctate epithelial erosions, keratitis, corneal pannus, etc., etc. Management, as we sort of talked about before, lid hygiene is, is uh, very, very important. So you can wipe the bacteria and the deposits using uh, warm, warm, wet compresses to loosen the collarettes and crusts in anterior blepharitis and dry, warm um, compresses, which melt the meibomian secretions in posterior blepharitis. And they recommend about 40 degrees for more than five minutes, but you can achieve that, as I said, with an eye bag, which is something you can buy over the counter now from the pharmacy or from Amazon. Pharmacological treatments, so staphylococcal and seborrhea, may benefit from topical antibiotics, as I've said, to reduce the bacterial load. And posterior blepharitis, you can consider giving systemic antibiotics, which are usually doxycycline or tetracycline for about a 12 week course. Um, these also have a modulating effect on the anterior, the ocular surface. So sometimes the, the effect they have on the matrix metalloproteinases reduces the inflammation on the ocular surface and that also helps. Herpes keratitis. Um, so this is uh, the next topic that was uh, commonly asked about. Uh, relatively common condition. Um, so the herpes simplex virus um, HSV1 is carried in probably about 99% of all human beings. So if you, if you don't think you've got it, you have got it, but you just don't know you've got it. Primary infections like this picture in, in the diagram tend to cause a blepharo uh, conjunctivitis with vesicles of the lids, but corneal involvement is actually very rare. So there's very little value in giving topical um, acyclovir or gangcyclovir to patients with blepharoconjunctivitis or primary herpes simplex keratitis. Epithelial keratitis, um, well these are um, commonly called dendritic ulcers. This poor patient in, in the diagram in the background is someone that's probably a bit immunosuppressed because that's what you would call a geographic ulcer because it's very very large. These patients present with a foreign body sensation, just like glass in the eye, they'll, they'll, co they'll comment. Photophobia, a lot of redness and blurred vision. When you examine them, you the first thing to do is to check their corneal sensation with a little wick of uh, tissue. And when you do that, you find they've got reduced corneal sensation. Um, and uh, when you then put fluorescein in, you'll see these classic branching dendritic patterns that you see in that picture in the background, uh, which is um, uh, classical of herpes simplex keratitis. They've got the little dendrites. Sometimes people get them confused when, when looking at corneal abrasions or healing, but the dendrites um, have got little bulbous ends to them. They've got little, almost like little fractal patterns with bulbous ends to them. And that is usually um, pathognomic of uh, herpes simplex keratitis. Herpes simplex can also affect people causing a disciform keratitis, which is uh, an endothelial keratitis, causing a circular area of endotheliitis, and that can cause corneal scarring. Often there's no epithelial um, damage in these patients, so there's no staining, but you can see these sort of hazy stromal opacities um, in patients. And sometimes they get a uveitis with it as well. How to manage them? Well, epithelial keratitis uh, needs to have topical antivirals for about 10 to 14 days. Controversially, some people say oral uh, antivirals are as effective um, as the topical antivirals, but without the corneal toxicity. Uh, and acyclovir and gancyclovir are equally effective. I mean, personally, I tend to use um, Zovirax or gancyclovir uh, for about two weeks and after about 10 days usually they get much much better and then you can stop the antiviral. If a patient has a disciform keratitis that needs to be treated with a combination of steroids and um, uh, an antiviral. So starting off with sort of two hourly steroid drops with either topical or and or oral um, antivirals and then the steroid drops are tapered 
rapidly. Oral, oral acyclovir may be, in this case, more beneficial as a topical uh, acyclovir um, and gangcyclovir doesn't tend to penetrate the cornea as well when the cornea is intact. When the corneal epithelial, epithelium is broken down, then these topical antivirals tend to penetrate the cornea a bit better. So um, uh, the oral in this case is often slightly better. And actually there's very good evidence to show that if you give patients uh, a, a fairly lowish dose, so 400 milligrams twice a day for once a year reduces the recurrence of uh, discoform keratitis by about 50%. Episcleritis, uh, so this is a very, very common and often self-limiting condition. Um, generally, you can get either a nodular type or a simple type. A nodular type has got a little elevated, elevated bump to it, whereas a simple type is just the vascular congestion of the episcleral plexus. Mostly they're idiopathic, um, but le about less than around 35% can be associated with a systemic vascular disease or systemic inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, SLE, psoriatic arthritis. Generally, the patients tend to have a diagnosis of those conditions and then present with an episcleritis and the other way around. Um, so it's worth asking them in, in your sort of medical history about um, presence of those particular conditions if they've had them in the past. And it, it is just vascular congestion of the episcleral plexus and the episclera and the tenons layer that get infiltrated with inflammatory cells, but the sclera is, is spared generally. And classically, you get this area of sectoral redness, sometimes with a nodule, sometimes without. Um, but what you don't get is a sort of violet colour of the sclera that the, that the scleritis causes. So this is a beautiful photograph of uh, episcleritis. It's probably a nodular one with a slight elevation to it. But in a scleritis, you get this very violet-like, sort of hazy, um, purpley appearance to the sclera. Um, so how to diagnose it? Well, you can instill 2.5% phenylephrin, which will blanch the conjunctiva and episcleral vessels, but doesn't affect the sclera. So that would sort of differentiate it between a scleritis and an episcleritis. If you give 10%, uh, it will blanch the episcleral vessels, but not the scleral vessels. Generally, if you leave these things alone, they will just get better on their own without any treatment. Sometimes oral nonsteroidal anti-inflammatories can be useful and can help. And in fact, there's no evidence that topical nonsteroidal anti-inflammatories can help. So Kitoralac or Acular, et cetera, there's, there's no benefit in those. Topical steroids can help sometimes, but just be careful with those if you are giving them, because apart from the obvious um, issues with regards to steroids, you can get sort of rebound inflammation uh, with uh, topical steroids. So I, I would um, be very, very careful about using th those. And generally these patients don't need to be followed up. So I wouldn't bother um, arranging a follow-up appointment, just tell them it will get better. And if it doesn't, then they can come back. Acute angle closure. Uh, so this is the, the, the real big emergency along with corneal ulcers, I suppose. And I put in brackets glaucoma because glaucoma is the, is the consequence of acute angle closure, uh, i.e. damage to the optic nerve head. Um, acute angle closure itself is a process the symptoms of it, and um, when you see an acute angle closure, you'll never forget it. I'm sure many of you have seen them in, in, in the community. Um, severe pain, um, nausea, vomiting, vision rapidly deteriorating, the pupil is fixed and mid-dilated, cornea is hazy, like in this, in this photograph, and patients often, uh, between groaning in pain and vomiting, they'll often say that, yes, they have noticed over the last few weeks episodes where they've noticed halos or rainbows around lights. Why does it happen? Well, you get um, closure of the angle effectively by the trabecular meshwork is, is blocked off by the, by the iris. Um, it's um, particularly prevalent in people who are hypermetropic, they're not always, um, and people who are older with a, a large chunky lens, women more than men, and some heredity it makes it more likely to happen. So um, Asian races, so Eskimos, Southeast Asians, Chinese races um, tend to be more prone to getting acute angle closure. In fact, 
of the glaucomas that they get in places like Singapore, 95% of them are angle closure uh, compared to 5% in the UK, uh, where 95% in the UK are primary open angle closure. How do we manage it? Well, um, in the short term, we can do an iridotomy, uh, creating a little hole between the um, iris and the anterior chamber, and that provides a sort of escape route effectively so that there's no pupil block and the aqueous has got somewhere to go. Um, this has become um, an interesting and slightly controversial area recently because lots of papers have been published which have now cast a lot of, of doubt on, on, the, on the benefit of um, uh, peripheral iridotomies, particularly in, um, as a prophylactic measure. I think if you have a patient who has established angle closure, um, it is a good idea to do a, a prophylactic PI on the fellow eye and to do a peripheral iridotomy on the patient who has angle closure once the eye is suitably uh, quietened down to, to do it. But an, an, and another trial called the Eagle study recently showed that actually taking the lens out in these patients um, is far more, is more effective than doing a prophylactic YAG iridotomy laser treatment. So more and more of these patients, if they've got cataracts or particularly visually significant cataracts, we would urge them to have their cataract taken out rather than having a, a peripheral iridotomy anymore. And in fact, um, so these photographs at the bottom uh, show you the, the sort of consequences of angle closure with the far left photograph having lots of iris stroma, a very distorted pupil because there's probably been ciliary muscle damage due to the ischemia. And there's a nice, um, if slightly large, iridotomy um, in the top left-hand corner. The middle picture with a little flex, that's what's, what glaucoma flecken looks like. So when a patient's had angle closure, they get ischemic damage to the lens capsule and those little glaucoma flecken appear. And then the last uh, image on the right is um, a, a really horrible YAG iridotomy that's enormous that someone's made in this poor patient's eye. Uh, I'm not quite sure why they made it so large. Um, anterior uveitis, uh, a quite common uh, condition that uh, presents um, to you in the community. Um, it can be um, part of many different disease processes, actually and it can be acute and it can be chronic um, and it refers to inflammation of the anterior uvea i.e the iris and the ciliary body it can be associated um, with other systemic diseases um, like uh, crohn's rheumatoid arthritis ulcerative colitis psoriasis etc but also it can be uh, it can be isolated patients who, who have hls hla b27 uh, um, they, they are more likely to get it and it's a risk factor and there's a question which is would you always break a saneki well you can try um, so if you when you manage these patients you want to give them um, uh, cycloplegics like um, midrelate or atropine uh, and that will attempt to break the saneki it doesn't always work though um, but um, trying to do cycloplegia will help um, and of course if you do cycloplegia them early then the pupil is out of the way, um, the iris is out of the way of the lens behind it and it's much less likely to get stuck down. Um, but quite often, and like in the photograph, the top photograph, you we find these patients in, when we come to do their cataract operation, they're stuck down like that and there's nothing gonna get rid of that other than mechanically breaking the Saneki uh, when, we, when we do cataract surgery. Um, the bottom photograph shows um, mutton fat precipitates. Uh, and when you've got that sign there, mutton fat precipitates, that's a very strong indicator that there's granulomatous disease. Um, so TB, sarcoid, those sorts of things. Hello, why is my slide not advancing? Ah, there we go. Examination. So patients will present with pain, photophobia, redness. Um, Often they have a very intense ciliary flush. So this is this uh, sort of very red area by the limbus. Um, what you want to do when you're examining these patients is to check the visual acuity and examine the anterior chamber very carefully for cells and how many cells you can see in a millimeter. Um, Carato precipitates, um, flare, so sort of proteinaceous flare floating around. Hypopian sometimes if it's very severe. We might also want to look and see if there are iris nodules and synecchi, as we mentioned already, and, and fibrin. 
uh, which is a, a sort of quite a serious sign of inflammation. It's very important to check the pressure in these patients because they can get secondary glaucoma or, or secondary, secondarily elevated intraocular pressures. It's also need uh, managing uh, alongside the inflammation. Uh, you also want to do a dilated examination in these patients in all cases because what you want to make sure of is um, that uh, there is um, no intermediate uveitis or posterior uveitis because that can be caused by a whole load of other uh, type of issues which might need more systemic investigation. Um, ensure no posterior signal involvement. That's what I was getting at really. Um, I'll go, I'll, I'll answer Mo's question um, in the question and answers bit about the YAG PIs. Don't forget to remind me, um, Ian and Mo. How to treat it? Well, topical steroids very, very frequently to start off with. So pred forte, so 1% prednisolone drops, maybe hourly uh, for a couple of days, and then reducing it gradually over a six week period of time when it tends to burn out. A topical cy cycloplegic is, is very uh, useful as well to help reduce the chance of Sinecki if they haven't already developed and also reduces the pain more importantly for the patient it really really um, settles the pain down and the pain patients tend to report almost always they, they report this as, as if they've been punched in the eye it's very very sore uh, very very uncomfortable and probably um, these are to be referred to us so that we can prescribe these um, steroid medications in particular So the last topic I wanted to talk about, I hope I'm all right for time. I think I'm just about more right for time, uh, which is a posterior segment one I thought I'd chuck in um, is flashes and floaters because this is still a very common uh, source of referral from MEX. Um, and I thought I'd sort of try and clarify some of the things about it because it is a bit of a, still a, a worrying condition for a lot of um, optometrists in the community. So a posterior vitreous attachment is a separation of the posterior vitreous cortex and, uh, and the retina. And as you probably know, the vitreous base are, is a very strong attachment, and that's around the aura serrata towards the front part of the eye. But there are also quite firm attachments around the optic disc margin and around the macula and around retinal vessels and some areas in, in the peripheral retina like in that cause lattice degeneration. And what happens in a posterior vitreous detachment? Why does it happen? Well, in adults, as we all know, the vitreous becomes more liquefied. And so from a being a solid lump of jelly for babies, it becomes a sort of bag of liquid. And then um, due to ongoing degeneration, the posterior hyaloid face tends to rupture and this liquefied vitreous then pours into the space between the posterior hyaloid face and the retina so the retrovitreous space, and it separates the vitreous from the retina, sort of peeling it off. And then patients tend to become symptomatic when the optic disc attachment separates from, um, from its attachment around the optic disc. And that uh, point of attachment is not transparent, it's quite opaque. And that's what people see as a, as a vice ring. So this is a beautiful OCT image uh, taken from a spectralis, um, no shares in spectralis that I have, showing the posterior hyaloid face as the faint line uh, above the above the retina there, and you can in fact almost you can in fact see the pockets of of liquefied material. Now this hasn't been a total posterior vitreous attachment because it, there's still some attachment um, to the optic nerve head, but the but the macula has peeled off, so it's probably a vitreous um, separation in progress. Why do we worry about these? Well, um, and why do we worry about new floaters? The reason is because traction can occur at sites of the firm adhesion of the vitreous to the retina. So the vitreous base, uh, you know, adjacent to the aura serrata. And these may result in a retinal tear. And sometimes can that can result in a regnatogenous retinal detachment if it's not picked up. The posterior vitreous detachment and, and vitreous degeneration is a common event. It's, an, it's very important to emphasize this. If you look at all people over the age of 60, more than 50% of them have had a PVD. 
whether they know they have or they haven't. Um, and these tend to manifest with, as you know, um, new onsets of floating objects and lots of flashes of, uh, of light, uh, which often happen because of little points of traction of the vitreous against the retina. Usually they settle down very, very quickly. And if you examine the patient and you, you do a good peripheral examination um, and don't find a tear, they're very unlikely to, to have a tear. So um, I think, I think Statistically, I think you've had a posterior vitreous attachment, only about 10 to 15 percent of patients develop a retinal tear. So best way to, to exclude a retinal tear is to examine with an indirect ophthalmoscope and indent. But realistically, um, very few people do that apart from the vitreous retinal surgeons, even in the hospital. We don't do that as a matter of course. I will do it if a patient, if I've got suspicion about uh, there being a retinal tear and I can't see it when I've examined them through other ways. So using a slit lamp and using a three mirror lens is probably a very good way of, of examining the patient and you will very likely to pick up a retinal tear using that method. But even if you examine a patient who is fully dilated with a 90 field lens or a, oh, sorry, 90 D lens or a super field lens, you're very likely to pick up probably about 90% of retinal tears. If a patient though has got a vitreous hemorrhage, then you're very likely to have a tear whether you can see it or not and those are the patients so if you see patients with new floaters and a vitreous hemorrhage um, but you can't see a tear those patients do need to be referred because they're the ones who are likely to have a tear uh, which is go, can go on to a detachment so these two pictures i put them up because it also shows you what can different pathologies that can cause people to worry so the picture on the right is a renal tear and you can actually see retinal elevation there because that sort of pale area of retina that's lifted up. And that needs a retinopex, although actually that looks quite like a, quite a large area of retinal elevation. So that might either need cryotherapy or a VR surgeon to, to manage that as an early detachment. But the image on the left, that's actually a round retinal hole with an operculum. Now, why I've shown you that is because it illustrates the point. <coughs> if you, your perculum has separated from the retina so there's no traction on the retina, that's very unlikely, in fact, almost impossible to become a detachment. So I wouldn't laser that or I wouldn't treat that. I would reassure the patient and say, don't worry about it. It will, you know, it won't, um, it won't progress because there's no actual direct traction on the retina now from anything. That flap has fully come off the retina and um, therefore they're very unlikely to to develop a detachment. And I think that's all I have to, to say. So where are we with time? So we're doing okay with time. And I think there are some questions in the q and I don't know if, if Ian wants to come back in at this point, he's welcome to. Can you hear me, Cash? Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. I'm just trying to get the screens back on. Uh, I'll let my computer out. Yeah, we have got a few questions. And um, so if you're happy for me to answer, can you stop sharing your screen for me? Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. No one wants to see my screen anymore. Yeah. yeah, yeah I'll just get this. So, so yeah, so we've uh, had quite a few questions. Um, so um, rust rings, going back to the rust rings, yeah. I think you'd like to see them all removed when they do the, the treatment for the rust rings. As much as you can, um, I think would be uh, would be good. Sometimes, you know, once you get the big chunk of foreign body out of the way, um, you um, you're left with a little bit of a, a rust ring around there. And sometimes, if you sort of tease the way gently at it, a, a bit of it comes off, comes off, comes off. And sometimes there's there's a little bit left over that you just can't get rid of. And if if nothing more is coming off, just leave it alone. Um, you know give the patient topical antibiotics um, afterwards and probably cycloplegia because it will be quite painful afterwards for a few days. Um, and as it epithelializes, it will tend to heal over and, um, and that rust ring won't tend to generally cause them any problems. Thank you for that. Um, so with the anterior uveitis, would you always break the synechae? Um, so, you, as I said, you try and attempt to do that by um, giving cycloplegia with um, atropine or, or, or mydrolate, uh, which is cyclopentolate 1%. Um, but, um, you know, if that doesn't work, it doesn't work. Uh, and there's not, there's not a lot you can do about it. I mean, some people, you know, inject midrocaine um, and, and that can sometimes help break, which is like much more potent um, cycloplegic. 
but I think unless it's very, very severe or, you know, there's a concern about there being um, iris bombay, I probably wouldn't do it. It's, it's not, it's not the very common presenting sign of, of uveitis, um, sinicae, um, but they do happen. Um, and often if you cycloplegia them, they, they, the sinicae break, but sometimes they don't. And when they don't, and then they come to cataract surgery, then I, we have to literally separate the, separate them before we, we dilate the pupil with a, a, a pupil expander, expanding device, and then we get on and do their cataract operation. Okay, thank you very much, Cash. Uh, the next question is not my question, but I agree with this one. Uh, we'll see more peripheral iridotomies at three and nine o'clock positions these yeah. days, as opposed to the 12 o'clock position. Is there a good reason for this? It's, 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 a, good, it's a very good question, actually. Um, and it's, it's about how um, the, the sort of evidence changed. So when I was, when I was a lad, <laughs> as a registrar, we were, we were taught to do it at 12 o'clock underneath the where the lid margin was um, and then there'd be very little chance of stray light effect um, getting in and that would be less problematic for the patient. Then there was a paper which um, suggested that actually if they were not really very or if someone had quite a retracted lid or they were not very peripheral uh, and they were slightly in their tear meniscus the upper lid margin tear meniscus wedge then you could get refracted light through that wedge tear meniscus in, in through the peripheral iridotomy and then they'd get stray light effects so then then the fashion became doing them at three o'clock and nine o'clock um, because they felt that there would be less of that um, stray light effect and there was some evidence to suggest that patients didn't seem to complain as much about it i must admit i don't do them at three o'clock and nine o'clock i still do them at 12 o'clock but i just cite them very very peripherally and I think that the fashion has sort of changed back again to doing them at 12 o'clock again. So you'll probably find there'll be less patients with them at three o'clock and nine o'clock now and more of them back, back up at 12 o'clock. But actually, as I alluded to in the lecture, you're probably going to find less and less patients having peripheral iridotomies and more and more patients who have um, narrow angles but have cataract, any level of cataract, um, having cataract surgery um, and perhaps putting a new lens in because once they've had the cataract surgery, then... Um, angle closure um, stops being a risk. Lovely, thank you. What time frame constitutes new onset for flashes and floaters? Well, your, your risk of developing a tear or detachment really is in the first six weeks of developing um, new onset of floaters. So if it's after six weeks, they're very unlikely to have a tear or a detachment there that hasn't, managed, hasn't become a detachment, put it that way. Um, if it's below six weeks, then I probably would see it. I mean, I, I, I probably would advise a patient with any new onset of floaters to see one of you guys, you know, um, as soon as they can, sort of within, within 48, you know, 72 hours, really. Um, but, you know, practical considerations being, uh, you know, getting access is, 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 the, is often a limiting factor. But if they're there for weeks, then I wouldn't worry about them too much. Um, so, should we refer PVD with associated peripheral flame hemorrhages? It's a good question. Um, I think if the, if, the, if the flame hemorrhage is intraretinal, then no, probably not. Uh, I mean, I say that advisedly. I think, I think no one would criticise you if you referred it, um, if there was a hemorrhage, because there's obviously a concern that there might be an, an, an underlying tear in that area. If, if it's an intraretinal hemorrhage, it's likely that it's just the vitreous um, base separating that's causing it, and it's not likely to require any management. But I think, I think, I think in that sort of circumstances, it would be perfectly reasonable to refer that. I think, I think where we get a bit annoyed in the hospital is when we get referrals which say Schaefer positive, and then we look at the patient and it and, and no retinal hemorrhage or anything. Um, no tear identified but Schaefer positive and then we examine the patient and it's not Schaefer positive that that's a bit irritating because you think well you know did you really look um, because it, it either is positive or it isn't positive um, and um, if it isn't positive then don't refer it because you know there's no need and you can reassure the patient uh, and advise them to come back to you if their symptoms change because of course you can see a patient with a PVD and have no signs of a tear, no shape of positive, and then a week or two later, 
then they, they do develop a tear. So you should always give them the um, avenue to come back and see you should there be any new symptoms. Yeah, lovely, thank you for that. And can you get acute angle closure with pseudofakes? Uh, uh, yes and no. Um, you, it's practically impossible, but if you've got a, a lot of existing um, uh, peripheral anterior synechi from other problems, um, like someone who's had primary angle closure before or some other inflammatory condition, yes, you can get, um, you, you, in theory, you can get angle closure, but it's incredibly unlikely, actually. They really have to have a lot of PAS to then get angle closure once they're pseudophagic. Um, and, you know, I, 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 consequently, if I've got a patient who's had angle closure before, I don't do a surgical iridectomy when I do a cataract surgery because it's so unlikely that they're going to get um, buccal block afterwards. Mm -hmm. Lovely. Thank you very much for that. That's the questions. But the one final question for you is, what, what golden nuggets can we, should we take if we remembered one thing from tonight <laughs> in the hospital? What, what would you say to us? Um, oh, I don't know, really. Um, it's very difficult, isn't it? I mean, I think, you know, you, every, you're all doing, you know, a fabulous job in the community at the moment. Uh, I know that um, there's a lot of demand on MEX in particular at the moment and the MEX providers. Um, and I think it's got a lot worse actually recently. And I, I, my theory for that is that um, I think the GPs who are not seeing patients face to face now are now not managing anything or not even attempting to manage anything in, in, in their practices. And they're just sending everyone to Max, which is good, I suppose, in a way, because it means they're finally using it. But it is meaning that we're now um, reaching the limit, very limited capacity that Max can, can offer. Uh, and we probably need to look at expanding it in this area to have more providers for MEX so that there's more more choice for the patient and more capacity in the community uh, because the, the hospital trust has got very limited capacity. It's still, I mean, we still struggle um, with the volume of referrals we get, um, although, you know, we, we will try. Certainly, it's always worth um, asking us if you're not sure and you think well i want to refer something a lot of you have got access to our whatsapp group please feel free to um, message us um, via that and me and mr kashani uh, are usually quite good at, uh, at responding quite quickly uh, to queries i mean if you've got pictures or, or video files or whatever that's always brilliant because that really gives us um you know a, a visual representation of what it is you're seeing and we can often um, advise about about what to do. Um, I know it's difficult sometimes to get a hold of um, the hospital doctors to speak to them because they're, they, they're not that accessible, but I, I'm hopeful that this sort of WhatsApp group that we've got now might actually make life a little bit easier for you all to actually be able to, to contact us when you've got a, a problem. Um, I mean, in terms of any specific um, management things. I think I would encourage you guys to, to, to try as best you can to manage as many of the things as you can in the community and feel confident about it because you are very good. And I think generally speaking, the quality of referrals has got a lot better um, uh, recently and uh, you are very capable of managing these things um, in the community just as well as we are in the hospital. And it's often a, a lot more convenient for the patient um, to see you guys than it is to come and see us and spend ages waiting in a hospital and of course nowadays with the with the pandemic we just don't really want people congregating in one place for for a long time so it's it's, it's all the more important to have access to to you chaps um in the community and, and i i am rather skeptical about the sort of telemedicine um things that uh, more fields are very you know keen to trumpet i i, I don't i I think there's, their data is very disputable, actually, in terms of how successful their telephone triage was. And I, I don't, I'm not an advocate of it. I'd far rather the patients see yourselves in the community and get properly examined than someone talks to them down the telephone. It's not really, for ophthalmology, it's just not really an appropriate way of examining a patient, in my view. Well, so thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kureshi, for that excellent talk. I know I've picked up quite a few little useful bits of information that I'll be using when I see these patients. So I'll aim to get the CET uh, uploaded onto my CET this weekend. Uh -huh.
and I will try to get the webinar edited so you can view it again on YouTube this weekend. I know a couple of people have had problems logging on. Uh, yeah, I do apologise for people who couldn't log in. These this new, new angle technology that we've got. Uh, so if you do have any thoughts or sort of feedback for us for tonight's webinar or any topics you may like to see, then please feel free to let us know on the WhatsApp group and we'll, we'll see what we can do. The next webinar is uh, in the process of having CET applied for and we're hoping to announce a date soon for hopefully mid-September where hopefully it will be a lot cooler than it is at the moment. But keep looking at the WhatsApp group. I might be a bit smarter then. I won't be in my, my slovenly, my slovenly t-shirt and shorts. I'm going to have to go to the answer. Uh, thank you all. Just be cool, that's all. <laughs> thank you all very much for watching tonight and uh, hope you've had a good evening. Please stay safe and uh, we hope to see you again uh, very soon. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Ian.